Hi, this is Randy Speck. I'm the superintendent of the Madison District Public Schools in Madison Heights, Michigan, just north of Detroit. And this is the first edition of Leading Unafraid. This is going to be a weekly show that we have here on Disrupt Ed TV, where we talk about some subjects that are happening inside our schools. From time to time, we're going to talk about early literacy. From time to time, we're going to talk about classroom management. But we also, as school leaders, we need to be talking about some other things. We need to be talking about vulnerability, what it means like to really give of yourself as school leaders within the classroom, within the school itself, within your school district, within whatever it is that you are leading. But today I'm excited as we start off with Leading Unafraid, our first couple of episodes, it's going to be a two-parter. Uh, we're going to talk about trauma. We're going to talk about the effects that trauma can have on students, uh, both in their home, with the, with the, with the kind of the, the baggage and their life experiences that they bring uh, to the classroom and to the school and how that affects our school. And I'm so excited uh, to have two friends of mine, Chip and Lisa St. Clair. They're going to be with us here on these next two episodes. We're going to talk about really what brought them to discuss and want to be a part of healing trauma for kids. But you can't do that unless you go back and you got to talk about some stories. So Chip and Lisa, thanks for being here. Great, Great to, to be, be here. here. I'm glad you guys can be. So, Chip, part of this whole journey of getting to why it is we want to really talk about, because talking about trauma is a big deal just to begin with, whether it's adults or students. But your story itself, you did not have a normal childhood growing up. So when 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 our kids here in a few few days are coming back to, to school to start 2019, as a seven, eight, nine-year-old, what was that like for you as a seven, eight, nine-year-old? Yeah, uh, to say my life was full of trauma is is an understatement. You know, my um, my father was incredibly abusive. He was a, a, a maniacal person. Mm -hmm. My my mother a horrible alcoholic. So um, my childhood was riddled with all sorts of. Um, uh, underminings of my security, of my safety, uh, violent episodes, uh, watching domestic violence, watching my mother get beaten, watching, um, uh, you know, hearing my father scream, awakening to uh, some sort of violent act, or, um, uh, you know, just going through um, constant terror, walking on eggshells. So, uh, and being an only child, I had no one really to to, to rely on, to help me cope with any of that. So for me, even at such a young age, I found sanctuary in the creative arts, in literature and poetry, uh, in writing and drawing and painting. So what does that do to a, a, a child who is elementary, middle school age, and certainly the, the, the physical or verbal abuse can, can, be, can be something, but what of just the, the tension within a home that, that, uh, that uh, elementary student or middle school student or certainly high school student might be feeling when they're coming back to school. Mm -hmm. does, it, does that carry over from, from home to school? Absolutely. It's impossible to separate uh, that home life from when you're in school because you're, you're carrying all that, um, all that pain, all that anguish. And a lot of times you carry this guilt and shame as well uh, for what you're, what you're going through. Uh, you don't want anyone else to know. Um, you're afraid to tell your friends, you're afraid to tell your teachers. So a lot of times you're just internalizing this. And just like a, a, you know, a splinter, and trauma can come in many forms. It can be as, um, uh, as common as a divorce in the family or as extreme in my situation as physical or, or, or verbal abuse. Um, it, it's even a splinter can become infected over time if it's not treated properly. So. Uh, when you're dealing with these sorts of um, emotions and you, you're constantly internalizing them, you're not allowed to cope with them or, or deal with them in a healthy way, get them out, um, it starts to eat away at your self-esteem. Mm -hmm. It starts to uh, crumble your sense of security. Uh, it starts to uh, force you to put walls up brick by brick to sort of cut off connections mm -hmm. with others. And then you're cutting off your lifeline and your helpline as well. Yeah, I've, I've heard this before. And, and some of the folks who might be watching this right now, you've probably heard this as well uh, in school leadership where a parent or someone will say, 
hey, listen, your job in the school is, is to deal with math and science and teaching kids how to read. It's not to deal with other things that happen within the world. But the problem is when the world comes into our schools, we have to deal with it. Mm. And we're negligent. We are negligent school leaders if we're not dealing with some of these issues. Chip, I want you to tell a, a story that I've heard you tell multiple times. It's going to be the Lake Michigan story. Mm. Uh, this is a tough story to hear. And, and I'm going to reference um, uh, Chip's book, multiple times over the next couple of weeks called the Butterfly Garden. Once you get you a copy of it, we'll tell you how to get to that here in, in a little bit. But uh, when you're a young child, your family, your guys are going on, on a little vacation. You're up at Lake Michigan. Take it from there. Yeah. So my father was, like I said, he wasn't someone to argue with, but he had this bright idea one morning uh, that he wanted to get me in a rowboat. And he said, we're going to row across Lake Michigan mm -hmm. to the other side. Which sounds fun. Sure. I mean, for yeah. a kid yeah. with his dad sure. going out. But knowing my father, there was something sinister behind that uh, that invitation. And um, so he gets me in this rowboat, and we go out uh, around this little bend. You know, anyone who knows Lake Michigan knows it's dark and it's mm -hmm. cold. Uh, even in the summertime, it's probably not much above uh, 59 or 60 degrees. And uh, we get maybe a few hundred yards out, and he can see the fear in my eyes. I've never been in water that deep or that dark before. And he looked at me and he said, why don't you go for a swim? And I, Dad, that's okay, I'll swim closer to shore. I was, you know, I was in t-shirt and shorts and flip-flops, I wasn't prepared to swim. And he looked at me and he said, are you afraid? And I didn't know what to say. My, my throat uh, kind of closed mm -hmm. up with fear. And he said, I think you need to face your fears. And that's when he picked me up and threw me out of the boat. Put, threw you out, out of the boat into Lake Michigan. Into Lake Michigan and rode away. And I remember thinking I was going to die. I remember feeling so cold and alone and watching him get smaller and smaller as he rode back toward shore. And I remembered a poem that I had recently read called Invictus. And the last lines of that poem are, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. And that really became a mantra for me as I fought the cold and I fought my fear and I fought the water and made it back to shore, um, no matter what my father would do to me, I knew deep down that I had these embers of hope. I knew I had literature to cling to. And that really began my affinity for the power of the creative arts. And that uh, began sort of my, my coping mechanism uh, that would help me endure another decade or so of abuse at his hands. Yeah, I think about that. You process that story when you're listening to it. I've had the privilege to, to hear uh, Chip speak multiple times. I've heard this story, and, and, and the story never, never really loses its shock. But when you think about our kids, when they're coming back to school, when they're coming into our hallways, when our teachers meet our students, especially when they start a new year, we've got kids who are afraid. We've got kids who have fear. And as teachers and as school leaders, what are we doing to, to create an environment where they can appropriately face fears, but to do it with love, to do it with people who are coming alongside them and, and, and being a support system. And Lisa, that's where I want to bring you in here because you guys met in high school. Yes. And, and so, so talk about, talk about the journey that you guys had and, and, and what it is you saw in Chip to say, you know what, this is a guy that not, not only do I want to be with and, 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 and spend, spend my life with, but how does that affect a relationship when you're talking about trauma? Yeah, that's such an important question because uh, when we met 26 years ago, my greatest concern in school, and my home was my safe place. I remember jumping off that school bus and just running home and, uh, you know, tossing all my books on the ground and laying back on the bed and just, um, that was it. That was the greatest thing and listening to music and my greatest concern was, um, whether I was wearing, you know, the latest fashion or, you know, getting good grades or uh, my friends, uh, I didn't have those kinds of concerns and I didn't know those existed. And um, uh, it may, it may sound um, strange to think that I, but when you're in a home that we all think that the world is as our home is showing us. So, um, so yeah, meeting him and uh, I think what drew me into him especially was there was this, I couldn't read him. He held his emotions very close, uh, but uh, he was very, very thoughtful and very sensitive. But um, I think the more that time went on, um, I started to see little behaviors 
that um, like somebody dying and him not crying, not showing that I know that he really cared about or um, uh, just certain certain things that would happen in, in everyday life. Yeah. And um, and so it's it it what it does is it starts to people underestimate uh, what the others that aren't dealing with that kind of a, a home life yeah. um, have to go through too because we have to be that support system we have to we have to uh, set aside our frustrations and all of that to try and really get to the bottom of, of what's going on yeah I mean when you know uh, just to bring up a quick story when I was in third grade I had a teacher that um, it was a particularly difficult time for me We've been going through, um, I had been going through a lot of, um, there was a lot of violence at the home, a lot of uh, emotional abuse, a lot, of, just a lot going on at that particular time. And I was having a hard time concentrating and focusing. And I remember, um, you know, when you're all sitting there and you have to read along, you have to read a passage and then someone else, one of the other students, yeah. picks up the next paragraph and reads aloud. And I kept losing my place. And she just would, would scream at me. And so screaming the for teacher. me, the, the teacher, teacher would. Yeah. yeah, the teacher would just scream at me. And I remember um, my heart would race as if it's my father. You know, mm -hmm. just hearing that screaming was a trigger. Um, my, I would get, my palms would get sweaty. My, uh, I could feel my, my pulse in my, in my throat. Right. And I thought it was a life and death situation. And, and so I hated going to that class. And I ended up getting detention after detention from her because I couldn't find my place in reading. And she had no idea what was going right. on in my home, but right. she had no tolerance right. because I wasn't falling in line. So I wonder, Shiv, did you ever have any kind of a, a school leader or anyone who created an environment for you to feel safe? It's amazing you, you say that because Mr. Kasem, I'll never forget him, he was our principal. And when he saw I was having this trouble and constantly in detention and I was crying one day, I didn't want to eat my lunch in detention again because I was a good kid, you know, and, and uh, I just couldn't focus. and. The teacher didn't get it. He uh, he said, you know what, Chip, I'm gonna eat my lunch with you every day you have detention, so don't worry, you're gonna have a friend. And I think it was that support that Lovey showed me, and he might have had a suspicion something was going sure. on, but he, he cared enough to be there for me and be that support. That's awesome. Well, it's important that, that school leaders that were doing something to create environments for kids, and teachers, administrators, food service workers, don't yell at kids. Stop yelling at kids. Why are we yelling at kids? Create an environment. That, listen, they're seven, they're eight, they're 10 years old. They've got stuff that we don't even know. And, and just like that particular principal, he didn't know the story. He didn't know what you were coming from, but he knew that he needed, that you needed him. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what was for. All right, so fat, we're going to fast forward to a birthday that you're having when you're in your early 20s, right? You guys are, you guys are together with your parents. Take it from there. Yeah, so uh, celebrating Lisa's 22nd birthday, uh, my mother's uh, well inebriated by that point in the night. Um, we were at my parents' apartment just, just to have this little birthday celebration, mm -hmm. and I had been slowly trying to break those ties to get away, but there's always this invisible thread mm -hmm. that I think holds uh, kids from who come from traumatic childhoods to the parents, to the abusers sometimes. And uh, I just hadn't broken completely <clears throat> away yet, so we're sitting around the table talking about current events in the news, and my father's just getting belligerent. He's calling me all sorts of vulgar names in front of Lisa, my fiance at the time. And I'm like, yeah, I can't take this anymore. And she always told me, if he ever gets like that, just get up and leave. And, and I never really let her into the, the extreme uh, right. trauma I was going through, the abuse and, and all of that. But she knew there was some tension between me and my father. Yeah, he would say that they, you know, they were arguing. So my visual of an argument is a conversation. It's not right. violent. So... Well, that particular evening turned violent. When I got up to leave, my father chased me down, began choking me, beat me, and eventually dislocated my shoulder as I tried to fight him off. Um, Lisa, in the meantime, had the good sense to call the police. So when I was taken to the hospital, my father was finally arrested for domestic violence. And it was after we got out of the hospital that evening, I didn't call my mother because she was supporting my father. She was the classic enabler, right. uh, enabler you know, so... Um, uh, I called my aunt, my dad's sister, who lived in Indiana, and I was looking for some family support because I wanted to press charges. Finally, he was in jail. I could take a stand and do what was right. And uh, so I, I called Aunt Chris, who lived in Indiana, and it was about midnight, and I said, I don't know if you've heard what happened. And she said, yeah, your mother told me. And I said, I've got to press charges. I'm, I'm done dealing with this. 
And she said, Chip, there's something I have to tell you. You can't tell Lisa. You can't tell anybody this. But your father's real name is not David St. Clair. It's Michael Dean Grant, and he's one of America's most wanted fugitives. So you're finding out right then yeah. that, that your dad is one of America's most wanted. Um, and on the run 30 years. On the run 30 years. So you spent your entire life. Yes. On the run. Unknowingly on the run, yeah. moving over 30 times all around the country. So all of these things started to make sense. Why we move so often, um, uh, my father's violent rage, the finding out he had actually murdered a child, was suspected in the killings of up to five other kids. And somehow I survived that. And now I have to put together my past, my traumatic past, yeah. with Lisa's love and support and my grounding in the creative arts to try to be, not become my father, but do something more noble yeah. with my life. Yeah. Listen, this is, this is an amazing story. They've become good friends of ours. The, the, the Butterfly Garden is where you, where you will find this story, uh, find, the, find, find Chip's life and Lisa's life. And, and, and what, what allowed them, uh, him specifically, to be able to come out of dealing with, with major trauma. And, you know, the kids that we have in our school system, whether you're in a fluent school district or one that is um, low income, high poverty, they're, they're not all, all going to have these kinds of stories. This is this is a this is a traumatic, extreme story uh, to a degree that the life experience that, that Chip has had. Not all of our kids certainly have anything like this, but they are needing love and they are needing support. And whatever trauma is happening in their life, it is extreme because it's happening to them. And we've got to be really great school leaders and school administrators, teachers. Uh, who can again create safe environments for our kids? Again, the butterfly, the butterfly garden is the name of the book. It's been in a lot of different curriculums, a lot of different schools throughout uh, throughout the country. You guys uh, started a foundation. Uh, talk to me in sixty seconds about the, the the butterfly foundation. Yeah, so we wanted to be a part of healing, and what I had stumbled across as a child as a means to cope and find hope, the arts and literature. We decided to turn it into. Uh, therapeutic curriculum to be able to bring to kids in disadvantaged communities, kids who suffer all kinds of trauma, uh, from divorce, uh, death of a loved one, to abuse uh, and poverty, to be able to bring creative writing, yoga, uh, the, the healing benefits of creative expression through art and music. So bringing these into the schools and seeing the kids transformed, since 2007, we've helped change the lives of over 10,000 kids, I'm proud to say. That's, that's and awesome. uh, we just, you know, that's, that's where we find our fulfillment and where I found a lot of my healing. What's the website to the Butterfly Foundation? It's stclairbutterflyfoundation.org or scbf.org. Okay, that's fantastic. Appreciate you guys being here. Listen, this is this is the first the first episode of Leading Unafraid. Uh, so, uh, first of a of a two parter. We're going to come back next week and we're going to talk about again trauma and healing trauma and and the effects of it that it has not only on kids but on families. And there's a huge economic impact that it also has when we don't deal with the trauma that's going on in the lives of our students and our families. Thanks so much. Bye bye.